Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Kalenda and I'm your host once again today on the Good News television show exclusive to God TV and I'm so excited about today because we have some wonderful things to share with you. I have a guest on the program today, his name is John Shiver. He is an evangelist, he's preached over 3,500 meetings in 56 denominations around the world and uh, he is a real blessing, he's been here with me all week and he will continue to be with me this week and I really, really can't wait for you to hear him. But also I wanna share with you some wonderful testimonies of what God has done. And then at the end of the program today, we're going to be praying for you, for your prayer requests. And so this is the time where you can use that contact information that's right there on your screen. Get in touch with us and let us know how we can stand together with you in faith and in agreement. I really believe with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit of God is going to reach out to you today and to touch you no matter where you are. Even if you're thousands of miles away from where we're broadcasting, there is no time or space with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that the arm of the Lord is not short. His arm is extendable and it's able to reach right into your situation today. So once again, use that information that's there on your screen and let us know how we can pray for you. And while you're doing that, I wanna share with you a testimony. This one comes from the city of Accra in Ghana. Uh, the name of the young woman that received this miracle was Rebecca Titi, and I remember this story very well. She was suffering with fibroids that had left her crushed and thinking that she would never be a mother. But an amazing thing transpired at our gospel campaign there. Jesus touched her. I want you to see what happened and remember that what God did for Rebecca, he can do for you today as well in Jesus' name. For some time now, almost about four months now, I've been feeling something move and I could feel the pains, I could feel something move in my left side of the womb, but though I didn't know what was wrong with me. I went to the hospital after the scan results, it was proven that I have fibroid. Yeah. I was so sad. Like, I was like, I'm young. I want to have a family of my own. I want to get married. So why fibroid now that it would hinder me from getting pregnant or something? The doctor says I have fibroid. I don't know what to do. As I left the hospital, I was like, then why don't I go straight to the crusade and then prepare myself for whatever God has for me? Maybe that's where I'll get my healings. Praying, I, I felt that something has been, a burden has been lifted. Like I called on the name of the Lord, not just calling Him, but I had faith in Him that He will heal me. And then as we were praying, He said you could do what you couldn't do at first. So I started touching where I had the pains in my left side of the tummy, but I couldn't feel anything and I realized that God has healed me. I didn't feel anything. I pressed deep into my tummy and I didn't feel anything. <laughs> I said, praise God, I was happy. And what did it turn out to be? It was fibroid. Fibroid? Yeah. And was it causing you pain? Yeah, I could feel that there was something there. If I touched my right side of the tummy, I felt something move in there. But now after the prayers, I was touching and I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't feel any pain again. No more pain? No more pain. No more, you can feel it? There's nothing, I feel normal, like, from the right side. 
I feel normal there. There's nothing there. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for this miracle. I bless this sister in Jesus' name. God bless you, sister. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. I maybe I want to jump and scream. <laughs> Hello everybody, thank you for watching Good News, our new series exclusive to God TV. You know, the good news is only news if we share it, and it's only good if it's changing lives. As disciples of Jesus, as His messengers, we must tell the world of His great love for them. His love saves, His love redeems, His love is higher than all of the governments of this earth. This is our good news and we must preach it. You can help us to share the good news by simply supporting the broadcast of God TV. Did you know that God TV is reaching over 280 million homes globally, even airing in closed nations? But we need to expand the broadcast so that every nation and every home can hear the message of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to please go online to God.tv slash good news to help support this must be heard message. Thank you for being a part of the global media mission field and thank you for watching. You know, the story that you just heard from Rebecca in Ghana, that is not an extraordinary thing at all. We are hearing stories like this happening literally every single day during our gospel campaigns in Africa and all over the world because Jesus is a healer. He loves to heal people. He loves to save people. He loves to deliver people. And it's not just happening in person live at the gospel crusades. It's also happening right here on this television program. And that's one of the reasons I'm so thankful to God TV for partnering with us to send the message of the gospel around the world. And John, I, I don't know about you, but I have often run into God TV all over the place in some yes. of the most remote corners of the world. Has that been your experience? It has been. I've <clears throat> in our travels to all the places that God has sent us around the world many times in a hotel room, a restaurant mm -hmm. sometimes. You'll see on, on the television, there's God TV. Yeah. And it's literally covering the globe. And we're so grateful for the ministry that they provide. And it's remarkable yeah. to bring cutting edge, up to the minute reporting of what God is doing in the earth. It's, it's fantastic. And, and you know, one of the things I love about God TV is their commitment to revival, to yes. move the spirit, yes. and also to evangelism, yes. which is what this show is all about. Yes. And so they have had, I don't know if you're aware of this, I don't know if you're aware of it, but in recent months there's been a renewed emphasis within the ministry to really reach out to the lost, to see revival penetrating to the ends of the earth. And so it is a, a real joy for us to be able to partner with them. Absolutely. So I just want to encourage you, if you love Christ for all nations, if you love evangelism, if you love revival, you need to partner with God TV. We love God TV. We partner with them. We're asking you to do the same as well. Now, the program today is called The Good News. And uh, the reason that we call it The Good News, John, is because that is what the word gospel means. Yes. And Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. A lot of people wonder what does the good, what, what is the good news or what is the gospel? What does that mean? Some people think that it means a style of music, uh, you know, gospel music. Well, no, the, the good news of the gospel is the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And it literally is the most powerful message in the world. It has the power to change your life today. And so, uh, John, what I'd like for us to do is to turn to the book of John. <laughs> it's a good name, right? <laughs> I like it. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to go to chapter 2. And we're going to read the story of the wedding in Cana of Galilee, which may seem on the surface to be maybe an unlikely scripture, to bring the gospel out of, but I see some really powerful truths in here. So I'll start reading first uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And on the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. 
Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, draw out some now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you have kept the good wine until now. And this was the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother, his brothers, his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Amen. You know, um, I believe it was John that said of the exploits of Jesus that there were so many of them and they were so wonderful that even if all uh, of the books in the world would not be able to contain yeah. the, the stories of the things that had been done there. And... Um, this is an interesting observation coming from the disciple that Jesus loved because John's gospel, as you know very well, John, is not a collection of random stories. No. They are incredibly powerful and appropriate lessons and all of them have one underlying theme in mind. You know, the, the, the apostle John was an unashamedly biased reporter. He was trying to convince us of one thing in his thesis of the whole book was John 20, 31, when he said, these things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And it's also important to remember that whenever you read the book of John, that John uh, utilizes an ancient rabbinical method of teaching more than probably any other New Testament writer. And it is called the Ramez Method. And what Ramez was, it was an ancient rabbinical method of teaching where the rabbi would bring his students along with him step by step right to the point of understanding the principle of a story, and then he would back off. And he wouldn't state it explicitly. He would let the students make that discovery themselves, and then they would have this sort of aha moment. That's actually a brilliant way to teach because when a student has that revelation for themselves, they never forget it. It's much more effective than just, you know, explicitly stating everything. And this book, the book of John, is full of these aha moments. And when the Holy Spirit illuminates these things in our hearts, revelation begins to pour off of every page. I mean, I can go through the book of John page after page after page and show the incredible things that, that the Lord has showed me over the years. But here we are talking about the turning of the water into wine, which is the very first of Jesus' miracles. And it had a very profound effect on the people around Jesus, including the disciples. It says right here in verse 11 that because of this miracle, the disciples believed on him. Yes. This was the miracle that caused them to say, yes, he really is who he says he is. And to most, it probably would have been seen as a demonstration of his power, perhaps uh, a revelation of his messianic identity. That, that is to say that he was the Messiah that the people had been looking for. But I believe the disciples would later on come to see that there was a much more profound meaning to this miracle than what they had seen on the surface. You know, John was the last of the gospel writers to put down his thoughts uh, on paper. And he did this as an old man. He had obviously had many years to think about and pray about the good old days and reminisce what it was like to be with the master. I'm sure that if I know anything about human nature, John would have played and replayed the memories of those miracles over and over in his mind. Every healing, every teaching, every wonderful manifestation, he probably thought about it a thousand times. Can you imagine the longing that must have been in John's soul as an old man to go back to those days with the master? just to break bread with him one more time, yes. to, to lay his head on Jesus' chest and feel his heartbeat one more time, to see one of Jesus' miracles again, or to, to listen to him teach. There must have been nothing like that in the whole world. And I'm sure that John would have 
would have dreamt of it many times. And even in his sleep, the memories would haunt him, rolling through his heart night after night. And when the dreams would evaporate with the first light of the morning and he would wake up, his only consolation would be those words of Jesus, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. And I think one day, you know, as John was writing his gospel, he was reflecting on that miracle in, at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And as he thought about it, the words of the governor of the feast impacted him in a way that, that they never had before. Suddenly, as he thought about those words, there was such incredible meaning. This is what it said. It said that when the manager had tasted the water that had turned into wine, he didn't know where it had come from, although the servants that drew the water knew. He called the bridegroom and he said to him, everyone else serves the best wine first. And once the people are drunk, basically, then he serves that which is not so good. But you have kept the best wine until now. And I'll bet you that John began to, th to, to think about that and say, wait a minute. Could it be that the miracle of that water that turned into the good wine and was saved for last was actually a type and a shadow of a greater miracle and a better wine. I bet John's memory flashed to that moment when they were in that upper room together right before Jesus' crucifixion where he sat next to Jesus and he heard those mysterious words come from his lips when he held up a goblet of wine and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. You know, biblical covenants were blood covenants. The first one was made with Adam and it demanded the blood of a sheep. And there was the blood of lambs and goats and cattle and birds. But now as the Old Testament era of those blood sacrifices was culminating and coming to a close, we see that at the very end, after all the blood had been shed, the blood of goats and sheep and cows and rams, God had saved the best for last. In Cana, water became wine. But in Jesus, the word had become flesh. In the same way that the bridegroom in Cana had offered all that they had to their guests, so many had offered everything that they had to God through the ages. Priests and religions and methods of man, people had offered everything that they had to God. And after all of man's offerings had fallen pathetically short, then God stepped in and he gave his best for us. His best, safe for last. You know, Jesus had gone to the wedding in Cana, John, as a guest. Yes. But it ended up being that he was the host. <laughs> you know, we may invite Jesus to come into our lives, but the truth is that we have nothing to offer him. He enters our bankrupt, broken down shanty, and he spreads a table for us. He serves us a banquet. He gives us his best. And it's not just some random meal. It's himself. He offers us his own body and his own blood. This is my blood, which is broken for you. So his blood was not only his best, it was also the last. Yes. Remember what the governor said. He said, you save the best. We talked about that. But he said, you save the best for last. You know, when, uh, when a soldier is dying on the battlefield, a medic will come to him and give him a potent dose of morphine or some pain-killing drug. And that drug is not intended to save the soldier's life. The soldier's going to die. The, sol the, the drug is just there to mask over the effects of the pain and ease the suffering temporarily. In the same way, you know, the blood of animals throughout the ages in the Old Testament, they could never save anybody. They couldn't remove sin. They couldn't fix the root of the fatal wound of sin that was in the human soul. So these old covenant sacrifices, they would mask the symptoms for a short season, but they had to be offered every year again. But the blood of Jesus was something of a totally different quality. It was different than any other blood that had ever been shed before because the blood of Jesus not only dealt with the symptoms of sin, it went straight to the heart. It dealt with the underlying root of sin. It was not just some superficial remedy for a shallow flesh wound. It was a, a remedy that penetrated to the core of the human condition. 
went all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, reversing the curse and turning the greatest tragedy in history into a mighty victory. The ruler of the feast said, you've kept back the good wine until now. You saved the, bless, the best for last. After all the other wines had been served and after they had all run out and run short and proven to be not enough, finally the good wine was being served. The best wine was saved for last. And you know, I, I see this first miracle of Jesus as a prophetic foreshadowing of what Jesus had come to do. The Jews were hoping for a national Messiah that would come and start a sort of Maccabean type revolution that would free them from the chains of the Roman Empire. But that's actually not what Jesus had come to do. He came here to lay down his life and to shed his blood. When Jesus sat at that last supper and he held up the cup of the Passover and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. After all the blood of goats and lambs and birds had been shed, and after all of it had run out, Jesus performed a miracle. He himself became, the word became flesh. His body was broken and his blood was shed once for all. His blood did what no other sacrifice had been able to do. You know, there is enough power in one drop of the blood of Jesus to wash away every sin, yes. to heal every sickness, to break every chain, yes. to demolish every curse, to deliver every person that has ever lived in all of the world and in all of history. That's the power in one drop of the blood of Jesus. Yes. God truly had saved the best for last. You know, can you imagine being the hosts of that wedding feast? <laughs> What an embarrassment that must have been. You invite all these people to come and you're supposed to serve them. You're supposed to give them a good time. And then you run out of wine. You know, r running out of wine at a Jewish wedding would have been a very bad thing indeed. A, big deal. a very big embarrassment. It shows that whoever organized that wedding was not very smart. They obviously had miscalculated. They obviously had tried to scrimp and save at the wrong place. But I'll tell you what, there was one thing that the organizer of that feast did that was very good. It was very wise. In fact, this one decision was so good that it undid all of his bad decisions. The one thing he did right is he invited a man named Jesus to the wedding. Yes. This is the wonderful thing about Jesus, that when you invite him into your life, he comes into your mess, and he ends up turning it into a miracle. Because wherever Jesus goes, everything changes. Maybe as you're watching this right now, maybe you've not been very smart over the course of your life. Maybe you've made some very bad decisions. Maybe even right now you're in a very bad situation. And it's nobody's fault but your own. That's true. And you say, why have I been so stupid? Why do I keep making all the bad choices? I'll tell you what, my friend, there is one choice that you can make today that is more important than any other thing. If you never make another good choice in your life, make this choice to invite Jesus in because when Jesus comes in, he turns everything upside down. He changes those tragedies into triumphs. He transforms that mess into a miracle. He did it at the wedding of Cana of Galilee and he'll do it in your life as well. So you know, my friend, what I, what I wanna ask you is, would you like to invite Jesus to come into your life? Would you like to invite him to come to receive his gift no, you, you don't have anything to offer him. But when he comes into your life, he'll spread the table for you. He offers himself to you. The question is, will you receive him? If you'd like to do that, John, would you just be willing to pray with that person that's watching and lead them into that relationship with Jesus right now? Absolutely. Well, it's just so important that we understand that everything that God does, he does because of love. And he loves you. He cares for you. He brings everything we bring ourself and present it to him. That's all that's necessary. He looks at our heart. There's no situation that's too difficult for him. There's no circumstance that we can be in today that God has not already found a way to move us, move us forward. But it begins at a moment of faith. It begins at a moment of asking Jesus to be Lord. Let's pray together right now. Wherever you are, in a hotel room, at home, wherever, 
Let's pray this prayer together. If you'll pray this prayer and mean it in your heart, God is going to do a miracle for you today. Let's pray. Yes. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you that you did save the very best to the last. You gave us your son. Father, we thank you today for that great sacrifice that you made on my behalf. I come to you now by faith and I receive by faith that gift yes. that you have made possible to me. I receive Jesus as the Lord of my life. Yes. Have mercy on me. Wash me. Cleanse me by the blood that Jesus shed. Make everything new. I know today that when I ask, you hear my prayer. Yes. And today you've answered. I receive now Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. And Lord, I commit to serve you from this day forward until I stand before you and worship you face to face. Yes. Thank you. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. Carlos, can I have those requests that have come in? John, we want to lay our hands on these, and there, there's quite a few here, too many, I think, to go through one by one. But the Lord knows every need, and we're just going to lay our hands on these in faith. Lord, we pray right now for every one of these needs that's represented. Lord, for those that need healing. Yes, Lord. Lord, for those that need deliverance and yes, Jesus. financial provision and Lord, those who have lost loved ones, prodigal yes, sons and daughters, yes. call them home in Jesus' name. Lord, we yes. send the power of God into every situation, yes. into every life, yes. into every physical body. Yes. Lord, for that one that's watching right now that is yes. in pain, Lord, I thank you that pain goes and yes. that sickness leaves right now. Yes. Lord, we thank you for healing. We thank you for yes, a miraculous intervention right now in Jesus' name. Yes, Father. Amen. Amen. My friend. If you receive that by faith today, I am sure that a powerful miracle is on its way for you. If you've already experienced one or if you've received Jesus today, I'd love to hear from you. Use that contact information on your screen and let us know what God has done for your life and how we can continue to uphold you in prayer. John, thank you for being with me. Thank you, Dan. I'll, we'll join each other again tomorrow on the program. Right. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow on God TV on The Good News.